Welcome to our next series on dispensational theology. We are going to be looking at today a, a brief overall view of what a dispensation is. And that's our first ob objective, is to uh, define as clearly as we can what a dispensational, uh, what dispensationalism is from the perspective of a dispensationalist. And I say that because you may have heard a lot about dispensationalism online, and much of what is online about dispensationalism is either unkind, unflattering, and also often very inaccurate. So here we're going to be looking at dispensationalism from the point of view of one who adheres to it and believes it uh, is exactly the right approach to handling the Word of God. Now this concept of dispensationalism is hard to condense into a simple uh, brief definition, but we're going to try to do that as uh, well as we can. And I'm going to share some various men who have defined dispensationalism, and perhaps each one will add a, a, a slight different ingredient to it, a different layer of the onion, if you will. And overall, I'm hoping that we'll have a, a pretty good idea of what it means, what a dispensation is, in the scriptures. So that's what our goal is today. So let's begin with C.I. Schofield. He was a Congregationalist and he was a, a leader in dispensational theology a century or so ago. And he defined a dispensation as, and I quote, a period of time during which man is tested in respect of obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. Seven such dispensations are distinguished in Scripture. So that was his definition, and he has much more to say about it in his other writings, and I highly recommend that you read uh, his other writings. But his definition, and no, I'm not faulting him, no definition could add all the details that are necessary to understand uh, a dispensational theology. And he does, however, point out a couple of important ingredients in dispensationalism. He notes that there is a specific revelation uh, concerning God's will in each dispensation. So each one is characterized by a new revelation. And also he points out the fact that man is tested with respect to that new revelation, whether he will abide by it or live in accordance with it or not. Now, some critics have uh, dismissed Schofield's de definition of dispensationalism. Uh, they view it as faulty because he begins his definition by describing it as a period of time. Uh, now, the Oxford English Dictionary defines a dispensation as the action of dealing out or distributing. That's an accurate way of describing it. They also describe it as the action of administering, ordering, or managing a system by which things are administered. That's a helpful way to understand what a dispensation is. Or the action of dispensing with some requirement. Schofield's definition doesn't quite fit the bill in that his, his first word, the first way, and always in a definition, the first word that you use is the most important. And Schofield began his definition, and I think it was just a misfortunate use of words of his, otherwise his, un, his understanding of dispensationalism is fine, but the first word is so important, and a dispensation is not essentially a period of time. Every dispensation occurs during an age or a period of time, but that's not what a dispensation is. A dispensation is first and foremost the action of administering or dispensing the affairs of a household. Charles Ryrie defined a dispensation as a distinguishing economy in the outworking of God's purpose. 
And that's a little better because his first word is a distinguishable economy. I guess that's two words. An economy is a great way to describe a, a dispensation. The English word economy comes from a, of the Greek word found in the Bible, oikonomia. And it speaks of a stewardship. It speaks of an administration or a management of the affairs of a household. And that's really what an economy or a dispensation is. Rari also noted later in his writings that in, in the world of politics, there are political economies. There is communism, one political economy, and there is capitalism on the other hand. Now, in any kind of economies, there are going to be similarities. Uh, between communism and capitalism. They both have leaders, the people are to obey the laws, etc. But there are also very vast differences in different economies, such as communism and uh, capitalism. They're to two totally different uh, ways of viewing uh, the economy. And so is the case with God's purposes. All of the dispensations are working towards God's ultimate purpose. And there are differences in the different economies as God's purpose and plan is outworked through the ages. The overall purpose in every age and every dispensation is that God might be glorified. It's not redemption. That's not the overall purpose from the dispensational perspective. It's the glory of God. And so dispensationalists see that as the ultimate purpose in everything that God does, in every revelation, in every uh, different period of time in history, and in every different administration of his economy. So Ryrie adds uh, more ingredients, more flavor to the definition. Harry Ironsides, who was a Plymouth Brethren, he defined dispensational a dispensation as an economy is an ordered condition of things there are many various economies running through the word of god a dispensation then is a particular order or condition of things prevailing in one special age which does not necessarily prevail in another so here Ironsides mentions the fact that a dispensation or economy occurs during a time period. That's a better way of describing it. It's not a period of time, but obviously it happens in time. And there are different ages, such as the age of law and the age of grace. They were very different economies in the administering of God's affairs. And so what Ironsides adds is also helpful. God's way of dispensing truth and responsibilities to man may change from one dispensation to the next. Then Louis Sperry Chafer, he was a Presbyterian, and he defined a dispensation in this way. He says, and I quote, a dispensation can be defined as a stage in the progressive revelation of God, constituting a distinctive stewardship or rule of life. And I like that definition. And here, Chafer, it was the first theologian who ever wrote a systematic theology uh, in which he was based on a dispensational approach to the Bible. His definition adds the concept of progressive revelation, which is essential to a dispensational understanding of the scriptures that God gradually, over thousands of years, piecemeal, a little here and a little there, God gradually revealed truth to mankind. It didn't come all at once. Adam didn't have the Bible that we have today. So truth was revealed slowly over many uh, ages, and, and as men received revelation from God, they were accountable to that revelation. And we'll look at this concept more in detail later, but for now we should just note that believers in different dispensations have been given different amounts of revelation. And a believer in any particular dispensation is accountable only for the revelation that God has given up to that point. 
And so that's essential. <clears throat> For example, Abraham was a godly man, but as godly as he was, he didn't keep the Ten Commandments. He knew nothing about them. He had never heard them, heard of them. They were not revealed in his day and age. And so truth was gradually revealed and certainly living by the law of Moses with all of its sacrifices and all of its feast days and holy days, Abraham knew nothing of that. He didn't live that way. That was not his rule of life. Abraham had a different rule of life. Uh, he lived by the promises that God gave to him in his day and age. Scroge, he was a Baptist minister writing from Scotland, and he had something else to say about dispensationalism. And he says, and I quote, the word oikonomia bears one significance and means an administration, whether of a house, a property, of a state, or a nation, or, as in the present study, the administration of the human race or any part of it at any given time. Just as a parent would govern his household in different ways according to various varying necessity, yet ever for one good end, so God has at different times dealt with men in different ways according to the necessity of the case, <coughs> excuse me, uh, throughout one great and towards one great and grand goal, namely his glory. So Scroge adds another uh, layer to this definition, built on what we've already said, and here he adds an illustration of a family, which I think is very helpful in understanding what a dispensation is and how it works in God's plan. And he notes that just as a parent with children is going to govern his household according to the varying needs throughout time. Uh, when their child is a toddler, there might be some house rules that are appropriate at that point in, in history. And later on, as time goes on and that little toddler grows to be a teen, the house rules may change. Now, the parent didn't change, but the necessity of dealing with a child and dealing with a, a or a, rather a toddler and a teenager is different. And so there are different rules and regulations that might be appropriate at one point in history of that household and not appropriate at another. And that's how God administers his affairs as he govern, governs uh, the world and the history of mankind. So that's also helpful. Reynolds Showers, uh, he defines dispensational theology this way. He says it is a particular way of God's administering his rule over the world as he progressively works out his purpose for world history. Showers, who uh, once served the Lord faithfully in uh, Friends of Israel ministry, adds to his very brief definition an important uh, point that would be helpful to us today as well. And he says that it's God's way of administering his rule over the whole world. And so God has a, a plan for the whole world, and his dispensational ways of administering that plan is really part of a bigger plan and his, wor and his plan for the world and the universe, in fact. And dispensational theology fits into God's purpose for world history. And it's helpful for us to see these dispensations not as a unit all to themselves unconnected to history, but part of God's plan for world history. Another dispensationalist, Tom, Dr. Thomas Ice, uh, he said that God manages the entirety of human history as a household, moving humanity through sequential stages of his administration determined by the level of revelation he has provided up to that point in history. And that's helpful as well on this level. He speaks of the level of revelation, and that's the way God governs at that particular point in human history. That each dispensation 
has been dispensed or has been given revelation, and that determines the way God is going to uh, deal with mankind. That determines the rule of life for the people living during that administration, during that economy, if you will, of God's governing uh, history. And here we have one more definition we'll try to fit in. Uh, Paul David Nevin, not real familiar with him, uh, he said that a dispensation is God's distinctive method of governing mankind or a group of men during a period of human history marked by a crucial event, a test, a failure, and a judgment. And that's helpful to uh, see as well. He included that in his definition. Now, uh, this truth was taught by Schofield and others, and, and it's, very off, it's very commonly uh, seen in charts of, of the various dispensation. But this man included it in his definition, and I thought that was helpful. That each particular dispensation, there's a crucial event, like the flood, or creation, or, uh, and there's also a failure, where mankind fails the Lord. And we'll see that every dispensation ends in failure. And that's just a, a picture of what we're like as human beings. We're given grace by God, and eventually, over time, we fall on our faces and fail the Lord. And then judgment has to come to deal with that sin. And so this truth was taught by many others, but... And we'll expand on this later, but it's helpful to see that right up front in the definition. So, so far, we've only looked at the words of men. And I did this on purpose just so that we would see or we'd be given an overall picture of what a dispensational is from a dispensational perspective. Others are going to define it and describe it very differently. And hopefully this will help us in a broad with a broad overview of this concept. And then in our next se session, we're going to look at the term dispensation, and finally, we're going to open the Bible. And that's the most important part. That's what we're going to look at next time, how the Bible uses this term dispensation. And we're going to see that it's used in exactly the same way that dispensationalists use it today.